So I'm, I'm pleased to introduce Ben Lintner today. Uh, he's uh, someone who works not too far away from us down in New Jersey at Rutgers, and uh, we're finally getting him up here to give a talk. Uh, ben did his, his PhD at uh, UC Berkeley, uh, working on uh, trace gas transport in the atmosphere, and spent a few years as a postdoc and then a research scientist at UCLA uh, before moving to his uh, faculty position at Rutgers. And he works on a, a really broad range of topics. Uh, you, you'll get a small selection of that today uh, in this talk on the South Pacific Convergence Zone. But, but I really wanted to emphasize that he's done work on uh, trace gas transports. I noticed on his CV there's a sort of a 2014 paper on interhemispheric contrasts in the hydroxyl radical. Uh, so going f you know, all the way from uh, detailed chemistry to large-scale climate dynamics uh, and, and a lot of very uh, societally relevant work on, on land surfaces, soil moisture, precipitation, and, and how they all interact with each other. So, uh, Ben, it's all yours. Yeah, don't, don't ask me any questions about the chemistry in the <laughs> paper since I had such a small part in it. But, uh, yeah, so, you know, thanks for having me up here. Uh, Bill, Bill had actually invited me to come uh, in the spring. And uh, you know, since I'm not a meteorologist by training, I looked at the weather forecasts and it was calling for snow and you know, kind of freaked out. And, and it turned out to be a nice sunny day both here in New Haven and back in New Jersey. Uh, so you can blame, blame the meteorologists. But anyway, I picked a nice time to come up in the fall. Uh, so what I want to talk to you to, about today is some work that I've been doing, I, I uh, mostly my student, uh, Matt Nisnik, uh, has been doing some work on the South Pacific Convergence Zone, so I'll explain what the South Pacific Convergence Zone is. And I want to talk a little bit about, I think maybe the title that I gave here is slightly different than, than the one advertised, but uh, this is a talk about variability in the South Pacific Convergence Zone, in particular on sort of high frequency synoptic timescales. And then maybe if I have some time at the end, talk a little bit about biases in models that are kind of relevant here. And, and I'll, I'll kind of allude to some of those as well in the talk. So again, Matt Nisnik, my, my PhD student, is mostly responsible for the results that I'll talk about today. Hopefully I'll get a little time to show you some results from another student, Max Pike, uh, who's been doing some work on self-organizing maps. So, you know, I just wanted to lead off with a nice pretty picture. Uh, you know, this, this is a photograph that I took from a uh, airline flight uh, between New Zealand and New Caledonia, just looking at the nice cloudscape in the Southwest Pacific. Um, you know, one of the nice things about studying the Southern Hemisphere is that you get to go to the Southern Hemisphere because that's where some conferences are, so that was the opportunity I had here. Uh, so this is kind of in the vicinity of, of the feature that I'm talking about today, so that, that picture was taken somewhere in here. Here's New Caledonia. The South Pacific Convergence Zone is this area this very large area, you can see here Australia for comparison, large area of rainfall, this is a rainfall scale, that extends all the way from kind of the maritime continent, western Pacific warm pool region along the equator, you know, well across the Pacific uh, into uh, mid-latitudes, you know, it starts to die out in mid-latitudes, but it's, it's really an impressive feature in terms of its overall scale. Uh, and, you know, from the perspective of northern hemisphere, we often don't talk much about the, the southern hemisphere, so it's kind of an interesting place to study. So I'm going to focus a lot today on the synoptic interplay of circulation, moisture, and precipitation along the SPCZ as kind of uh, understanding how, how it varies uh, in observations, reanalysis, and a current suite of models that you're probably familiar with, the CMIP-5 models. Then some hopefully some preliminary results that we've been doing, looking at daily precipitation in the SPCZ region using a, an interesting tool, self-organizing maps, and probably won't get too much time to talk about the last topic here. Just to give you an overall sense of the, the geography and climate in the South Pacific, uh, so here's the South Pacific Convergence Zone, and then some of the other climactic features, you know, high pressure system off, or high, quasi steady high pressure off the coast of Australia, trade winds blowing into the SPCZ from uh, the east. Up here is the warm pool. You get in southern hemisphere summer or winter uh, monsoon circulation that develops uh, over, over the maritime continent extending down into Australia. High pressure up here in the, 
the North Pacific, there's Hawaii and the trade winds coming in like this, and of course the intertropical convergence zone to the north of the equator. Um, and also, you know, th this is a big ocean region, but lots of little island nations uh, exist here. And of course, if you're living on those island nations, uh, you might have to deal with things like flooding. So this was uh, a particularly uh, disastrous time in Fiji in 2012, both in January and April, which I'm showing here, uh, the island ex experienced pretty significant flooding. So, you know, the SPCZ as kind of the, the uh, one of the main drivers of climate in this region, certainly from the context of extreme events, we kind of want to know uh, a bit more about it. Also, you know, a lot of people have looked at the SPCZ, the South Pacific Convergence Zone, in the context of the El Nino Southern Oscillation. So work by people like Chris Folland, for example, have shown how the, the kind of axis, you know, if you remember that figure showing the, the sort of diagonal tilt to the SPCZ, the axis of the SPCZ kind of varies in response to uh, El Nino conditions. So during El Nino events, it tends to be shifted a bit uh, closer to the equator during La Nina or Enso cool phase conditions, it tends to shift in the opposite direction. And then this study in 2012 by Wenju Kai et al kind of documented a, a sort of extreme case in which the SPCZ essentially becomes zonal. Uh, it, in some sense, collapses, the SPCZ convection collapses and kind of merges with the ITCZ. And this, these kind of zonal, what they called zonal SPCZ events are very significant in terms of the climate of the, the South Pacific. Uh, you know, you're basically replacing a double convection zone with, with a single convection zone and that has important implications for the climate. The SPCZ is present uh, all throughout the year, but it's most intense in southern southern hemisphere summer. So D DJF is when when well, it's. Yeah, this for that extreme season, or is that this is this is a principal component analysis. I think it's for DJF. Uh, so it's basically showing. Uh, I don't even remember what this is. Principal component, maybe of OLR, probably. Uh, but it's basically showing the contrast between the SPCZ and the, the ENSO region up here. But the point was more to say that the, you know, there is this correspondence that when we have El Nino conditions, the SPCZ responds to them. Uh, and then under certain kinds of conditions, not related to the intensity of ENSO events, you know, you might, you might actually get a, a kind of collapse of the SPCZ convection. This is meant to represent the axis of the SPCZ and it becomes more or less zonal during these extreme events. So just in terms of, you know, some of the background about the SPCZ, you know, from a, from kind of the fundamental point of view, we're interested in how the SPCZ is generated and how is it maintained, you know, so why is it there? And in particular, you know, question that I'm very, that, that sort of intrigued me initially about this is, you know, why does it have the sort of distinct spatial characteristics that we see. So in contrast to the ITCZ uh, in the Pacific, the SPCZ has this characteristic diagonal tilt. We also see other features kind of analogous to the SPCZ in the Atlantic, the SACZ, and uh, sort of smaller uh, SICZ in the Indian Ocean. And there are sort of dynamical similarities between all of those features, but then important differences. So the SPCZ is, of course, mostly over the ocean, the SACZ is anchored to the, the continent of South America. So there's kind of interesting analogies, I think, to be drawn uh, between these different phenomena. Uh, Ken Dak Takahashi and David Battisti kind of looked into this in a nice paper back in the mid-2000s, where they were kind of looking at this fundamental question about SPCZ genesis. And they basically identified two kinds of paradigms, or two paradigms that maybe under, that, that, that maybe explain the SPCZ and they termed them Western control and Eastern control, kind of based on where, where the sort of center of action of each of these control mechanisms is. So in the Western control, uh, the kind of theories here, going back to the work of Linzen and Nigam in the 1980s, work by George Kalatis, Adrian Matthews, kind of point out the connection between the SPCZ and the convective heating that develops over the Western Pacific warm pool. So the Western control is more about, you know, controlling the SPCZ from that sort of tropical, deep convecting part in the Western Pacific. 
where I've kind of came into this is more in terms of this eastern control mechanism and that's kind of looking at the SPCZ in terms of the contrast between the eastern Pacific which is relatively dry at least away from the you know it's, it's very dry once you get above the boundary layer relatively cool and the sort of air masses you know kind of a ventilation effect with low moist static energy air masses being advected into the SPCZ uh, through the trade winds and also you know in some sense it's a very it's a highly coupled problem so you have a distribution of sea surface temperature and sea surface temperature gradients and large-scale subsidence so all of these factors seem to conspire together to kind of give us this feature in terms of you know why do we care about it well you know there's the obvious impact side things like flooding but also if you run climate models you're very familiar with biases that develop in climate models uh, so in the broader Pacific there are biases like the double ITCZ the fact that in the eastern part of the basin the models tend to simulate two convec convection zones uh, one in the northern hemisphere one in the southern hemisphere but in the observations we only see one there's also bias in terms of the simulation of in coupled models the simulation of sea surface temperature with the, the sort of uh, equatorial eastern Pacific being too cold so these, these are kind of well known uh, in the eastern Pacific and then in terms of the SPCZ we see biases that might be linked in some sense to these but one which I'll show you momentarily is that the SPCZ as simulated by models is often too zonal so it doesn't have the right uh, sort of diagonal tilt and it also tends to have convection deep convection that penetrates too far into the east so these are these are sort of common uh, biases and this kind of gives you a sense so this is a bit of a busy figure but basically the blue shading on here represents the observational target in this case the blue shading is the area enclosed by a particular precipitation ISO line in this case four millimeters per day so you can think of the blue shaded regions as being the areas in the tropics with relatively intense deep convection where it's raining a lot and then the various lines that are plotted on here are from 11 CMIP 5 models uh, basically showing where each of those models simulates the four millimeter per day contour so if there was a perfect match between the distribution of deep precipitating deep convection in the observations and the models you basically see all of these lines kind of outlining the blue shaded region so you know you can look at this as either an optimist or a pessimist so the optimist would say well you know the, the if you squint put on your coarse graining glasses that the models more or less put the deep convection in the right places in the tropics you get it in the western pacific across the equatorial indian ocean here in the, the sort of Amazon region uh, extending out into the SACZ but then there's also a lot of slop uh, you know in particular in the SPCZ which I'm focusing on the models tend to make uh, they, they don't have enough of the extension of the SPCZ into the, the mid, mid latitudes and they also tend to bring the SPCZ convection too far to the east and I have another figure later I'm not sure I'll get to it but kind of shows this a bit more clearly where you, you kind of see the net result of this is that the orientation of the SPCZ as simulated by the models tends to be much too zonal and also you know here th this kind of jumble of lines that's kind of the double ITCZ problem so I've looked into that a little bit there does seem to be some connection between models that simulate the you know kind of strong double ITCZ and some of these biases in the SPCZ but some of them are independent so even if you correct uh, the, the, the biases over here that doesn't necessarily fix what's happening over here so the basis uh, or mostly what I'll talk about today is SPCZ variability so I already alluded to some of this so on the interannual time scales we have the relationship between SPCZ kind of the axis of strongest convection and the phase of ENSO uh, on people have looked at this on long time scales showing that you know with with sort of centennial or millennial time scale variations in things like the intensity of warm pool SSTs or the SSTs along the Eastern Pacific that that seems to have some effect on the sort of spatial orientation of the SPCZ what I want to focus on more though is the on sort of the higher frequency part so here I'm saying on synoptic to intraseasonal time scales we, we see modulation of SPCZ intensity by various phenomena e equatorial waves mid-latitude Rossby waves of transients and the Madden-Julian oscillation kind of on you know the intraseasonal time scale uh, 
So I want to focus a bit here on the synoptic variability, you know, time scales of a week or so. Um, the synoptic variability turns out to be important uh, in terms of the poleward export of heat and moisture from the subtropics to mid and high latitudes. So the, the SPCZ seems to be a, a kind of preferential pathway along which that, that export takes place. And also, you know, kind of tying this in, you know, th there's been a lot of interest in so-called atmospheric river uh, events in the northern hemisphere, but there are southern hemisphere analogs of atmospheric rivers. And a lot of these kind of develop uh, sort of in the vicinity of the SPCZ. So there's some, there seems to be some connection there. So this is just a, a plot from some work by Adrian Matthews back in 2012. He was interested in connecting the sort of MJO band, you know, kind of time scales between 20 and 90 or so days to variations in the SPCZ region, basically just showing if you do a power spectrum, I think this is of outgoing long wave radiation, you do get a peak in the, the, the sort of MJO band. So uh, we've look, looked at this a little bit in models. Models have a difficult time simulating the MJO. So uh, anyway, what we're going to focus on is more in the synoptic part of, of this analysis. Uh, so I wanted to just take you back a few years to some work. This is how I initially became interested in this problem where we wanted to look at the relationship between convection kind of along the eastern edge of the what we call the margin of the SPCZ uh, and its relationship to the, the low level circulation. So at this, this time we were thinking largely in terms of this eastern control mechanism. So our motivation here was to kind of test the hypothesis that variations in the strength of the low level inflow if the trade winds into the SPCZ are strengthened, that that will have an interaction uh, in terms of the, the sort of large scale convective response along the SPCZ. So what we did was set up a composite analysis, and here we were focusing kind of on the, the sort of outer tropics part between 10 south and 20 south, kind of in this little yellow box. And we basically looked at an index of wind speed. Well, we were just focusing on zonal wind. The winds are largely zonal through that box. Basically conditioning the precipitation, that's actually in the bottom panel, and the moisture, in this case, uh, column water vapor from a satellite product, SSMI, basically looking at the difference in moisture or precipitation between periods of strong inflow, i.e., uh, you know, anomalously strong easterlies versus weak inflow or anomalous westerlies. So basically what I'm showing you here is the difference between weak and strong. And so what you see, uh, of course, the, the wind vectors in that box are anomalous westerly. We're looking at weak minus strong, but you get this kind of moistening signal I unfortunately didn't draw the mean SPCZ position on here, but basically all along the eastern margin of the SPCZ, you kind of see this deep uh, column moistening occurring. And the precipitation uh, kind of follows that basically when you have a weakened uh, trade wind state, you basically see a kind of development or expansion of convection along the eastern margin of the SPCZ. So to put this, you know, in maybe a cleaner picture, I'm just showing transects here, zonal uh, uh, transects across some latitude band. I think this is 10 south to 20 south. So basically just looking at the zonal wind component, the column water vapor and the precipitation. And so what we were sort of, what, where we had sort of started here was to say, well, we have between the strong and weak inflow phases, we have a relaxation of the trade winds. Basically the, the red is the strong case where you have strong easterlies, negative values. The blue is the weak easterly case. So the trade winds relax. We get a kind of moistening, you know, and you can think about this in terms of just cutting off the dry advection. You have less dry air advection from the east when the trade winds are, are, are not as strong. So you see kind of a, a bump up in the column water vapor. And then the precipitation, you know, you kind of get this expansion of SPCZ convection off to the east. Of course, it looks very noisy. But this was kind of the, the basic model that we had in mind. But of course, you can think about this from the perspective of cause and effect. You know, we were sort of starting with the assumption that the trades relax and kind of the moisture and convection respond to it. But it could very well be that, you know, the convection changes and, you know, ultimately that's why the, the trade winds relax. And it turns out, you know, following up with the subsequent analysis that I'll show, that I think that's probably the more plausible direction. 
So what my, my student Matt uh, Nisnik has done basically carried out this kind, of this kind of compositing analysis that we did in our 2008 paper. But here looking at a uh, state of the art reanalysis product, the climate forecast system reanalysis. So that's basically shown here in this panel. And then also interrogating this suite of uh, coupled model intercomparison project phase five, the, the current generation of models supporting IPCC, uh, the fifth assessment. So basically showing the, the multi-model MEM multi-model ensemble mean. And this is basically the same kind of compositing that we did in our, our previous paper. And you basically see in the climate forecast system reanalysis, you know, kind of this, the structure that we had before. And here I would point out, you know, and we saw this in our, in our earlier paper, but didn't really comment too much on it, that of course these, the, the changing winds in this little box are, are part of a much broader circulation. So you see this, remember this is the southern hemisphere. So cyclones spin in the opposite direction to what we're used to. So this is a, a low level cyclonic circulation. So we get kind of that low level cyclonic circulation. Interestingly, you also kind of see in the moisture field, uh, this is, uh, I guess, these are both eight, 850. So this is moisture at 850 millibar millibars and grams per kilogram. But you kind of get this, this kind of wave, wave like structure with moistening, drying, moistening, drying. Uh, and then this is the CMIP-5 multi-model ensemble mean. And, you know, it, it, I was actually surprised at how well uh, the multi-model ensemble mean matches the reanalysis. Of course, lots of things go into this multi-model ensemble mean. We're averaging about 17 models. You're kind of counting on the models, you know, to get sort of a signal that survives here. You're, the models kind of have to line up in the right way. Uh, so kind of locally, they do that pretty well. But you even get some of this, this kind of upstream uh, wave-like structure. Uh, so, you know, it, it seems that at least uh, in first, first glance that the, the models are kind of capturing this kind of synoptic interaction that I'll, I'll describe in more detail. Down here at the bottom is the precipitation uh, uh, response. So again, this is like the previous slide that I showed where we have during the, the weakened inflow phase, we get kind of an enhancement of precipitation uh, to the east. And the, the contour here actually is the, the, that corresponds to the four millimeter per day line averaging over all the weak inflow events. So you kind of get, you know, kind of a longer SPCZ extending out like this. During the weak inflow phase, that's the brown contour. Of course, it's very noisy, but you kind of get this more stubby uh, SPCZ where you get kind of an increase in precipitation down here, but it doesn't extend out as far to the east. Uh, the models kind of do that. Um, here you get a sense, I think, of some of the biases in the models. So, you know, uh, you get a, a, a kind of enhancement of precipitation in the weak inflow phase, but it's more like you're just kind of flaring up what we call this little nub here. It seems a lot more continuous over here. And you do get some of this indication of, of kind of, you know, making the SPCZ stubbier during the stronger inflow phase, but then maybe also shoving some of the convection down here. So we wanted to look at this, this video quality is poor. Uh, we wanted to look at this a little bit in terms of the, the sort of interaction, you know, what's actually happening uh, kind of in a transient sense. So one of the things we've looked at here is the composites of sea level pressure. So we basically wanted to look at sea level pressure during either the weak inflow phase, the reduced easterly phase, or the strong inflow phase, the intensified, and basically just composite those events, or composite sea level pressure with respect to those events. And then, then I'm gonna step this back in time. So I've kind of marked out a, a high pressure center and a low pressure center for the strong inflow in blue, and a low, low pressure center and a high pressure center for the weak inflow. And so let me start at day minus five. So the low that ends up over here in the weak inflow phase uh, or the high that ends up there in the strong inflow phase are this one and this one. And so you can see what happens as I step forward. You know, both the low and the high are propagating uh, off to the east. This is at day minus four. You know, so there's a strong westerly flow. This is southern hemisphere summer, so, uh, you know, this is kind of on the, the equatorward edge of the, the southern hemisphere jet. And at this time of year, it's weaker than it would be in, in winter. But you still, get these, you still get these transient circulations that are propagating along. 
day minus three, you can see actually relative to our target box that both these, uh, you know, both the high pressure center here and the low pressure center have kind of moved off to the east. And then they kind of go a little bit retrograde uh, at day minus two, so they're, they're kind of wobbling back toward uh, uh, the target box. And then at day minus one, we're here and back to day zero. So, you know, essentially what we're, we're sort of seeing here is you get these, these events that are kind of marching along. And out here in the, the southeastern tropical Pacific, <clears throat> just like we have in the northern hemisphere off the coast of California, there's a very strong uh, high pressure center, so uh, clockwise circulation in the northern hemisphere, counterclockwise circulation in the southern hemisphere. And so these, these, circul these, these eddies or these mid-latitude storms are kind of coming along and then they, they kind of encounter that blocking flow in the high pressure center there. So, you know, in a sense, they kind of scoot past and then they're, they're kind of entrained back into the, the sort of region here that influences the area that we were looking at. So this is kind of the picture at the surface. So then we wanted to see how things look as, as we move vertically. Uh, so here's the composites that we did at 850 millibars as before from this, the reanalysis. So we're using reanalysis here to fill in the gaps that we don't have because of you know, limited observations. This is the multi-model ensemble mean from CMIP also at, at 850. So you can see what happens as we go up to 700. We basically have a very similar structure. You have this low-level cyclonic circulation, the enhancement of moisture along the eastern margin of the SPCZ and this wave-like pattern behind it. You see that at 700 millibars. It also seems to be present at 500 millibars, and there's even some indication of it uh, all the way up at 250. But they're the, particularly in terms of the moisture structure, the anomalies are getting very small, so it's kind of hard to make out on this common color scale. So what this suggests is that we have a pretty deep structure uh, that has both this surface component, but then also this kind of structure uh, up through at least the mid-troposphere. And when we look at the CMIP-5 models, we see a roughly comparable structure. And again, w within you know, the, the sort of uncertainties with averaging together all of these models that may have their own sort of spatial biases, it's actually sort of surprising to me at least that we, we still have these fairly coherent structures as we move up uh, into the troposphere. So we looked a little bit in terms of, you know, we actually want to understand this interaction, you know, we're basically seeing in the weak inflow phase, we develop this, this uh, cyclonic circulation. So how does that actually affect the moisture? Because you might think about the moisture feeding into the deep convection. And so what we, what we did was to look at composites of moisture anomalies. Now this is done at different vertical levels. I don't think I have the labels on here. But 850, 700, 500, and 250 maybe. Well, maybe I'm off by, oh no, sorry, these are the lag plots. Uh, each of the two colors on here, that's it. The, the two colors represent different pressure levels. So red is 850 millibars, so that's kind of the low level moistening. And then blue uh, is 500 millibars, kind of mid-tropospheric level. And then these are stepping through time. So day, day zero is here, uh, day minus two here, and day plus two here. So, you know, at the day zero, just as a reference, uh, and this again is in CFSR and the multi-model ensemble mean over here. We kind of get uh, red at 850, so you kind of get this low-level moistening kind of in a, you know, kind of along the, the diagonal of the mean SPCZ. We see that in the, the multi-model ensemble mean, kind of above that at 500 millibars, co-located with that, that strong moisture anomaly at the surface. These are the differences between weak and strong. So we're, we're seeing positive here, relatively positive during the weak phase. So moisture conditions during the weak inflow phase. And then at, at low levels, we, we kind of see some of that wave-like uh, structure, maybe not as much at 500 millibars. But what's interesting is going back uh, in time, so this is kind of two days before the sort of peak of, of either the strong uh, in the stronger weak inflow, we kind of get this, this moistening that's occurring. And you'll notice that most of the moistening, maybe we see it a little bit better in the models, but that, that moistening tendency kind of in the vicinity of this box is sort of stronger at the upper levels at 500 millibars than it is closer to the surface. 
So it kind of suggests, at least to me, that we, we get some in advance of, of these kind of perturbation, these transients coming into the SPCZ region, that they kind of are generating a bit of moistening uh, at, at mid-levels. And that might be especially important in this region. Remember, we're, we're kind of on the margin uh, between strong convection to the, the west and southwest and relatively dry or inhospitable conditions to the, the east or northeast. And so, you know, kind of pumping up the moisture in the mid-levels uh, might, might be important to kind of prime the environment there to support deep convection. Again, you're doing this two pictures in the previous slide seems to suggest that whatever that thing is, it was invected right. in there. And now you're saying, no, it was kind of created or like maybe a wave would be. I think it's probably. It, a mixture of the two? I think it's probably a mixture of the two. And that, that's one of the struggles, I think, with doing these types of, of analyses is that it's, it's hard to tease apart what's forcing what. Uh, so I think there is some, there is some kind of in, in situ response there that's, you know, you know, and some of the theory that's been kind of developed to explain this sort of says that these waves come in and because of the sort of local characteristics there that they're sort of exciting a, a local convective response. But I agree, it's, it, you know, I think there's sort of consistency in these pictures, but it's not like a clean, it's not a clean se separation. So we just wanted to look a little bit at the, the sort of upstream characteristics. So this is doing a composite analysis now over 250 millibar winds, but looking three to five days out from uh, 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 either a strong inflow event or a weak inflow event. And looking in particular uh, at the upper level winds, because of course these, these anomalies, you can imagine that they're riding along the axis of the, the uh, southern hemisphere jet. Uh, and you do see, you know, it's, again, it's not like a, 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 a kind of uh, slam dunk, but we do see some differences kind of in the, the upstream structure of the jet. So during the weak inflow phase, if you kind of look over here, we seem to have a stronger uh, jet uh, maximum to the south of Australia. And that interestingly about the southern hemisphere jet is you kind of get this bifurcation where you get sort of a pathway uh, to the south and then also a, a sort of secondary pathway to the north. And that in the weak inflow phase, that, that northern pathway maybe is a bit stronger than what we get in the strong inflow phase. So to kind of tie this in, and some nice work has been done uh, by, by both Adrian Matthews and Matt Widlansky, that they kind of talk about the SPCZ, you know, the convection flaring up here in response to uh, transients that basically are fed into, you know, transients moving along this mean flow and then getting steered into the SPCZ region. So the weak inflow phase, up, upstream of weak inflow events, we maybe see a, a sort of large scale uh, structure that's more conducive to ultimately steering those, uh, those transients that are being spawned uh, into the SPCZ region. So our kind of picture based on this analysis was to you know, basically suggest different elements that we have, you know, a storm track in the weak inflow phase. Sorry, I didn't, strong, strong and weak. In the weak inflow phase, we maybe have a storm track that, that tends to preferentially uh, move uh, these, these transient eddies into the SPCZ region. In terms of sort of the, the pressure structures, you know, we have an anomalous cyclone that develops maybe as a response to these transient events coming into the SPCZ region, but also because the convection is highly interactive, you know, we can't really separate that cleanly. But we do, you know, kind of suggest that we have this, this sort of uh, upper level influence. So what I was initially thinking in terms of the low level modulation of the trade winds, I now kind of think that's, that, that's more of a response to just this upper level forcing and then sets up this convection and the, the sort of low-level circulation as a feedback uh, onto that. So I just wanted to talk a little bit, a bit more about the SPCZ storm interaction. So this is some follow-up work that, that we submitted with Adrian Matthews and Matt, Matt Widlansky this past summer. And that's basically building on some ideas. So Adrian uh, proposed in his 2012 paper that we, we should really think about the SPCZ as, as being sort of the sum of events or pulses of convective activity. I'm not quite sure how much I, you know, 
I, I think there's some merit to that argument, although, you know, when I look at the SPCZ in, in satellite images, you know, of, of various things, it seems to be pretty persistent. So, you know, there, there's often convection there. Now, sometimes it's more intense, other times it's less intense. So, it might be that the SPCZ is more or less there, but you get kind of these flare-ups of convection depending on what's interacting with it. Matt Widlansky, who was a PhD student with Peter Webster, looked a bit into the, the kind of interaction. So I mentioned the, the kind of storm, the, the sort of preferential uh, steering of uh, mid-latitude eddies into the SPCZ region under certain conditions. So Matt Widlansky looked a bit at that uh, and identified this region, which I'm showing here, the so-called storm graveyard. I guess it's appropriate that we're a couple of days from Halloween talking about the storm graveyard which is basically a region of negative zonal stretching deformation that's basically where du dx uh, becomes negative. And that, you know, in terms of simple kind of ray tracing uh, theory, you can basically show that, that that would correspond to increasing the refractive index of the mean flow that the, the waves experience as they're moving along. That increase in refractive index causes the, the sort of uh, equatorward deflection of these uh, eddies. So, Somehow this, this uh, storm graveyard seems to be important in setting up this steering pathway into the SPCZ. So we looked a bit at this uh, storm graveyard in the context of the CMIP-5 models. And the basic upshot is the, you know, we can look at the multi-model ensemble mean, that's the one down here. So the, the dashed contours are the observed, uh, and I for, these, these I guess are, are du dx values. So the dash contours are, are, you know, the ISO lines of du dx, and the blue shading is kind of comparable ISO lines, uh, but from the multi-model ensemble mean. So what, what seems to emerge here is that the multi-model ensemble mean has a weaker storm graveyard, so the, the sort of minimum du dx values are higher, uh, less negative, and also the, the sort of center of the storm graveyard is maybe displaced a bit to the northeast. So this, you know, if, if we have this kind of background uh, storm graveyard kind of influencing where the interaction between the storms and the SPCZ takes place, maybe some of the, the bias that we see where the SPCZ is a bit too uh, zonal is just because this storm graveyard region is, is displaced a bit too close to the equator. So the, the sort of region in which the storms get steered uh, maybe kind of has an influence on the, the, the geometry. There's a lot of variation, as you might imagine, when you look across the individual models, and this kind of points out maybe some of the danger in doing an ensemble average. You, know, you can look at, you can pick your favorite model. So I work a lot with GFDL colleagues, so actually I don't like that one so much. Uh, here's the GFDL model. You know, you can see that that one, that one has a storm graveyard that's much too weak and much too equatorward. Other ones, you know, the CSIRO model, the Australians, you know, they care a lot about southern hemisphere climate, so they try to get it right. Uh, their storm graveyard is too intense, also has that kind of spatial bias. Uh, the MPI model, they actually do a pretty good job. Um, this is actually, that, those are actually results when we run the CMIP, or when the CMIP-5 models are run with the ocean interactive with the atmosphere, sort of both the ocean and the atmosphere being solved by the model. We can also look at the AMIP style simulations, the atmospheric model intercomparison style simulations. So these are simulations in which we feed each of the models the observed sea surface temperature distribution. So presumably, you know, any, if any, any sort of bias that's being introduced because of errors in the coupling between the atmosphere and the ocean, uh, that, that at least from the ocean's perspective, that's kind of taken away by, by giving the atmosphere the lower boundary condition. And this actually does seem to clean things up uh, you can see here the multi-model ensemble mean. Uh, the storm graveyard is closer in intensity. I forgot to mention the percentage here is kind of the percentage intensity of the multi-model ensemble mean relative to the maximum intensity observed. So, you know, it, it's getting closer. It's about 90% as strong. And the center of the, the, the storm graveyard is much closer to what we see uh, in the observations. And the individual models also seem to be cleaned up a bit. So the upshot here is that giving the models the correct sea surface temperature distribution, even though this is an upper level uh, uh, feature, uh, 
that seems to correct some of the bias. Um, there's still quite a bit of intermodel spread, both in the position and in, in the magnitude of the storm graveyard. So it's not that, you know, only giving the model sea surface temperature is going to correct these kinds of biases. And we see similar, you know, if we look at other measures of biases in the SPCZ, uh, we, we see that. So giving the models the distribution of sea surface temperature tends to correct the tilt of the SPCZ quite a bit. You still get biases, pretty strong biases in the amplitude of the, or the, the intensity of the precipitation. So, you know, it's, it's not that we can completely correct things just by, by specifying the ocean. This is a bit of a busy plot, but basically we were looking at, uh, we, we kind of wanted to do uh, an attribution analysis to do some vor vortex tracking. So this is just kind of a, a composite analysis where instead of doing the composites like we were doing before, now we identify uh, vorticity anomalies, upper, upper level vorticity anomalies of a certain magnitude, you know, basically places where we, we expect we have you know, kind of this upper level uh, or mid-level, I think this was mid-level, uh, cyclonic circulation. And then just do the compositing uh, with respect to, to those anomalies. So here's day zero. Um, this is from looking at trim, I think using the reanalysis winds to do the, the compositing. The CFSR, the atmospheric model intercomparison project models in CMIP5 and the coupled models. And so it's basically showing you, uh, you know, kind of the precipitation response that we were seeing before. Uh, this is precipitation now, not moisture. But, you know, when you have this kind of cyclonic, uh, these cyclonic vorticities kind of in this target region, you get an increase in precipitation to the northeast, a decrease in precipitation to the southeast. It's, it's similar kind of structure to what we were seeing before. Um, and the suggestion here, kind of going back in time, although it, it didn't turn out, I think, as cleanly as we had hoped, but we can kind of track these vortices back in time, and I have a, a maybe cleaner result in the next slide. But you kind of get a sense, at least going back one day, uh, that you can kind of see, see this, these kind of anomalies, the, the vortex kind of tracking into that region. So it gives the sense that you know, these are incipient disturbances that are spawned outside of the SPCZ and then propagate into it. So this is just doing, you know, kind of a crude uh, vorticity tracking, just kind of looking at where a particular, you know, vorticity minimum, I guess, maybe I'm getting the sign wrong, but looking at, you know, these cyclonic vorticity anomalies and then just tracking their position back. I think this was done two days before, so, you know, going back the previous day and then the, the next day. And just kind of showing uh, within the CFSR and the multi-model ensemble mean where, where the various vortices that kind of ended up in that target region came from. And you can see a lot of the, the, the tracks are kind of from the, the southwest, sort of like what we would expect that these, these, uh, these anomalies are riding along the southern hemisphere jet and then get steered into this SPCZ region. There's a lot of, you know, the, the models show a general tendency for that, that kind of southwest, uh, northeast oriented axis of uh, vortex motion, but of course a lot of variation as well. So the, the individual model characteristics, I think, you know, the models are, are kind of capturing this interaction. Maybe it's not too surprising because even though they're coarse models, uh, they're still, they still have enough resolution that they can capture these larger mid-latitude uh, eddies. So, you know, in summary, I think, you know, what we've shown and what I'm fairly convinced by is that the CMIP-5 models reasonably capture this synoptic scale interplay of uh, circulation, moisture, and precipitation along the SPCZ. And that's despite the fact that the models still have biases in the way they simulate the SPCZ. So it's kind of like you get this, you get this storm interaction it kind of flares up the convection along the SPCZ or where the SPCZ should be. How the model actually simulates, you know, whether it, whether it simulates the other parts of the SPCZ, the more tropical portion correctly, I think that's kind of a different, a different story. So my prior work coming into this was to focus more on the low levels and the advection of dry, uh, relatively dry, relatively low moist static energy air into the SPCZ. But now I'm thinking it's more uh, that you know, you've got these disturbances coming in at upper levels and then through the interaction, partly through the response that we're interested in looking at, namely the convection, uh, 
that that feeds back on the low level winds. So, you know, this was kind of arguing this kind of low level uh, argument was, was maybe more of a thermodynamically oriented argument, whereas this kind of upper level stuff is more about the dynamics. I think that's all saying, though, that we have to care about both the dynamics and, and the thermodynamics. So when you, you get these anomalies coming in, you know, a big part of the story, if you were doing a budget, would, would be the effect of this low, low level uh, advection of low moist static energy air. Um, but that's different than, than doing it kind of in the, the cause and effect sort of way that we had initially hoped. Our lead lag analysis, it's not as clear as we had hoped it would be, but it does suggest that there is, we can see some upstream uh, differences in the jet exit region near Australia and the Southern Hemisphere storm track that really seem to maybe set up conditions that become more favorable for this interaction to occur. Then some things that we're currently working on, you know, we want to do a little bit in terms of Lagrangian trajectory analysis. I'm, I'm a big fan of, you know, Lagrangian parcel dispersion models. So kind of looking at the output from Lagrangian trajectory, a uh, Lagrangian parcel model, to kind of develop climatologies of, of the inflow air masses and kind of figure out, you know, in a more Lagrangian as opposed to Eulerian perspective what might be going on. And then some idealized uh, results with an intermediate level complexity model that I'm actually going to skip over. Uh, I had them in here, but I want to show you just a bit about the self-organizing maps, but that we can, we can with, with the aid of an inter intermediate level complexity model, we might be able to look a bit more into the cause and effect because of the simplifications uh, in, in the model, maybe tease apart causality from, from feedback. But let me, let me skip over that. Uh, we can come back here if you want. But I just wanted to briefly in the last few minutes here talk about the work by my other student, Max Pike, uh, who's just, just starting out, but I thought I would show these results because they're cool. This is applying a self-organizing map approach to analyze uh, SPCZ region precipitation. So just to go through this quickly, our motivation here is we have a large amount of daily spatial data, both from the observations and certainly from the models. You know, we have more data sometimes than we can handle. So how can we, what kinds of tools can we apply to extract representative and meaningful patterns from these data? Um, Ultimately, in doing this, what we hope to do is to be able to connect whatever patterns we might see to the meteorological conditions so we can make a physical, you know, attribution. But we can also think about using, using these just as a potential basis for comparing models and observations. So we can compute SOMs, self-organizing maps from the observations, compute them from the models and see how similar or dissimilar the SOMs are. So the tool, of course, is these self-organizing maps. So what are they? It's a neural network-based approach which consists of a lattice of interconnected nodes. I'll show a brief picture. But these nodes, the kind of outputs, are shaped by whatever input data uh, are, are put into the self-organizing map by a, a user-specified criterion or set of criteria. And basically, there, there's kind of a competition. You, you set up this lattice of nodes, and each node kind of competes with other nodes, basically, to see which one is most similar to a particular input datum. And the winning node, the node that looks most like the input, gets adjusted uh, so that it starts to look a bit more like the input. And actually, this it's a bit more complicated than that, because depending on how many, you know, the kind of radius of influence, you might actually have multiple nodes get adjusted. But the winning node gets adjusted the most. And ideally, then, what the SOMs do is distill a large data set down to some manageable number of structures that we can interpret physically. And this is, you know, you can think of this in much the same vein as what we do with a very common approach in geophysical data analysis, which is EOFs. We're basically using the EOFs as a way of distilling, you know, a large amount of data down to some smaller number of modes. So the SOM lattice looks kind of like this. We've got inputs over here, which are fed into uh, this kind of output set of nodes. Each time an input is displayed to the, the set of nodes, some comparison is made between, you know, it might be some Eulerian disti dis distance metric or some generalized distance metric that basically compares the input to each of these outputs. One of the outputs looks most like the input, so then there's an adjustment scheme that's applied to kind of shape the, the output to the input. And this is done many times. Um, 
So I won't, I'll kind of skip over the tutorial here just to kind of go ahead to the results, which I, you know, we're still kind of thinking about these uh, and, and precisely how to interpret them, but I think they're neat. So this is taking the trim data from 1998 to 2013 during DJF, so basically during the time when the SPCZ is at its peak intensity. And this is basically the result of a, a set of four maps or four outputs trying to classify the daily uh, snapshots or the daily averages of precipitation into these four categories. So, you know, you get some interesting stuff here. Um, these two down here, since I am interested in the SPCZ, these kind of have very active SPCZ convection, so this is rainfall in millimeters per day. So you get, you know, kind of intense rainfall in the SPCZ. You'll notice if you look closely and you can kind of use these islands here as a guide, that you have the, the strongest convection kind of closer to these islands in this group, and then it's kind of shifted away in this group. And you might expect, also when you look up here, you can see that the, the kind of dry region in the east extends further into the western Pacific here than it does here. So based on what I said earlier about ENSO, you know, th this seems to be the, the contrast between La Nina conditions, basically over here, and El Nino conditions over here. And in fact, you know, if we, we just take, now we have a small sample of data since we're looking at trim, but three El Nino or El Nino-ish years, if we just use those, you know, you basically can kind of see the same overall large-scale structure. So where we have convection in the SPCZ, you know, it tends to be shifted off to the northeast uh, relative to, say, the La Nina mode, where the convection in the SPCZ tends to be shifted off to the southwest. So, you know, in that sense, the SOM is cool because it, it can kind of pick out this known effect. We know that there's an ENSO signal in SPCZ region convection. What I'm more interested in is if we kind of focus, say, just on the La Nina uh, years when we're sort of correcting for this difference in the background climate. La Nina and El Nino years are very different in the Pacific. But you kind of get, you know, what we're seeing here two or maybe even three regimes in the SPCZ where, you know, here the tilt of the SPCZ is much steeper than it is over here. We kind of see the same thing in the La Nina phase where we have maybe a, a less tilted SPCZ regime here and a more tilted SPCZ region here. So what we hope to do, and again, you know, I'm just showing you the, the raw results here without much context, but that we can somehow relate these, uh, these kind of differences in SPCZ slope to different, you know, sort of meteorological conditions. So, you know, when you get a more tilted SPCZ versus a less tilted SPCZ, what does that actually correspond to? Does it correspond to something physically? I mean, that's always the, the key with these data analysis approaches is that, you know, at some level they're mathematical constructs, but we want to make sure that they're physically, physically meaningful. So, that's a work in progress. So I think I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs>